Hi everyone, welcome to this event uh, as part of the Academy of Social Sciences, Social Sciences Week. My name is Lauren Rickards. I am the director of the Urban Futures platform at RMIT University, which is a cross disciplinary platform devoted to addressing real world issues such as the one we're here to discuss this morning, renewable energy. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands I'm living and working. I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders past and present. And RMIT University also acknowledges the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. It's a real pleasure to be here with you this morning. We thank you for joining us uh, for this important discussion around the relationship between social sciences and one of the biggest challenges we face, which is, of course, renewable energy. So the need to accelerate the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy uh, is starkly clear, as are the other benefits that renewable energy brings um, over and above the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, it's also clear that this transition is far from simple and far from a sim uh, merely technological question. There are many, many social dimensions of this transition, which if neglected, stand to derail it, but if embraced, actually could help turn what could seem to be a mere shift in infrastructure into a much needed and more broad positive transformation. So enlivening this question uh, of our energy systems with more social science, and perhaps also enlivening social science with more engagement with the question of energy, uh, is what we're here to try to advance today. And to help me, we have a panel of stellar industry leaders from across different aspects of the renewable energy field. We're lucky to have with us Don Webb, who's Technical Practice Leader of Renewable Energy and Storage at ACOM for Australia and New Zealand. We have Jara Hicks, who's Director of Community Power Agency and has a deep understanding of social science research. We have Nick Abel, who has many um, uh, uh, hats behind him, uh, but is currently Policy Director at the Clean Energy Council. We have Michael Anderson, who's the Manager of Carbon and Sustainability at RMIT University. And we have Nicola Wyland, who's Senior Lecturer and Researcher at RMIT in the School of Property Construction and Project Management. So I've asked our panelists to kick us off by outlining uh, where they are positioned in the renewable energy field, how they've come to be there, and what are some of the social complexities they're grappling with? What are some of the questions they would love social scientists to help them with? And so to help um, us understand the work that they do uh, in the diverse area of renewable energy, uh, we're going to turn to each of them. And I'd like to kick off by turning to you, Don, if that's okay, and hearing a bit about the work you're doing over in ACOM. Well, thank you, Lauren. So a brief history for me, uh, originally trained as a mechanical engineer and joined the renewables industry in 2003, working for a, a consulting firm focused on, on wind. Uh, I guess my, my career is really around the utility scale renewable energy side of things, principally wind farms and sort of the engineering, commercial and project management side. I spent a few years working for a consultancy, spent some a few years as well working for a contractor in a project management capacity, again, building wind farms both in Australia and then um, the last 11 years I've been at, at ACOM, I guess, uh, broadening out to the different technologies as well, the solar farms and energy storage and so on, and working in that much bigger organisation, bringing different services to the industry. Uh, my role now, as Lauren mentioned, what we call technical practice lead for renewables and storage for Australia and New Zealand. I look after sort of capability and, and career pathways and, and a market interface for our, for our services. Um, yeah, I guess I've, I've since sort of done a bit more training in construction law, great dip and project management, those kind of things that move into more of a, a commercial focus. So very much the utility scale, technical and commercial background for me. Uh, but of course, you know, over the years, uh, especially in wind energy needs no introduction in terms of its sort of social or community issues that surround it. The, my background picture actually is for a wind farm in Victoria. I worked on a few years ago that was probably um, suffered more than its fair share of, it, of attention. Uh, but I guess it, it probably to summarise the issues of the social related issues that we come across 
and renewables construction. Obviously, the the, uh, the wind energy side of things and the visual amenity side of that is is fairly fairly well known. Um, this was the wind farm that uh, they publicly quite a while ago had an orange bellied parrot issue around it. I think one of them was going to get killed every hundred years um, by the estimates, and the wind farm lasts for twenty. But that those what was behind it, of course, some very interesting social issues around the attitudes towards renewables, especially at that time, uh, and the impact on community, and especially in, in visually sensitive areas. Uh, but on top of that, of course, renewables, grid scale renewables, take up a lot of land and do a big impact on local communities, local landowners, land use. Uh, and then you get some interesting issues creeping in there around what one landowner thinks of his neighbouring property who has the revenue or, or, or produces the visual impact um, of renewables on, on their property. And so it's interesting the dynamics gets up in communities around that, that um, the inequities, I suppose, that can happen economically around the compensation for, for renewables and where the money flows to in that, in that community out of these projects. And so it's just kind of, I think a lot of local developers have come a long way there in recent years and for example on, on wind farms it's not only the landowners typically anymore that have turbines on their farms who, who get some economic benefit but also neighboring properties as well um seems straightforward but it took a while for that sort of development to come to the fore uh yeah communities as, as i mentioned this can be quite it can be quite divisive the, the the human resource side of it in terms of um development and construction, it gets interesting. It's going to get much more interesting in the future, and I might come to that. But working on these projects, I guess what I get exposed to in the construction standpoint is a lot of a lot of FIFO type workers, um, people working on very remote sites. Um, you get some differing views or different uh, programs installed by by developers and, and contractors in terms of mandating local content um, in these projects, both in terms of manufacturer but also local contractors are trying to source as much as possible from the local communities to give back to that particular region you get differing approaches there and uh yeah i guess in, in the future a big unknown uh if anyone's looked at something like the amo integrated system plan which has uh, particularly in the step change scenario which we'll all be hoping for from a climate standpoint the amount of renewable energy at a, a utility scale that's going to be installed is is eye watering, and so a lot of the conversation of the recent CEC summit um, in Sydney, which is a huge, huge event and a very good vibe, Nick would know that, uh, was around what's the bottleneck going to be? Is it going to be human resources? Um, how are we going to get the skills locally to, to build these projects, or, or and or I suppose is it going to be the supply chain? Um, someone that has to make an awful lot of equipment. They've got to get develop technology at the same time and resource those the manufacture hopefully in um, appropriate factory settings most likely in in third world countries we can come that but there's some of the some of the key i guess um touch points for the social issues i've, I've come across obviously my focus is usually on the, there's a lot of pressure around technical and commercial matters but as well i said the um the social side um could do ours quickly so mm. from that Thanks, Don. That's a great um, start just in terms of, you know, understanding even at the pointy technical end, you're still encountering a, a deep array of, of social complexities, if you like. Jara, your neck up to your neck in the social complexities in the work you're doing re around renewable energy. Do you want to tell us a bit about what you do? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me here. And I'm joining today from Biripai country on the mid north coast of New South Wales. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this country and their ongoing connection and care for this country. So I'm from an organization called the Community Power Agency. We work primarily with communities who are wanting to engage with the renewable energy transition through doing their own renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. But that work also brings us in a lot of contact with government, with policymaking and with commercial developers who are wanting to better understand that interface between communities and renewable energy projects. So we increasingly do a lot of work um, helping translate, I suppose, between governments and communities and you know, large scale renewable energy developers. 
But just a bit of my background, I studied development studies at the University of Newcastle. So I started off with a human geography background and um, really critiquing the way that we do all kinds of development. Um, I, after my undergrad, I co-founded an organisation, the organisation that I still work for, the Community Power Agency. So it's now um, 11 years old. And our motivation was to provide provide people and to support people to have a positive way to take action in their communities on issues that that concern them around climate change and to have a positive way of responding to that through creating their own renewable energy projects. Um, through the process of that work of working with local communities, there are a lot of questions, social questions coming up for me, and that led me to then go and do a PhD. So um, I did my PhD, I started in 2014 and finished in 2019. That was through the University of New South Wales, um, through the law faculty and also the faculty of built environment. And my research was really looking at when communities go through this process together of establishing a community owned wind farm, what happens in a social sense? So what are, what are the social outcomes? Um, and my research was in, informed by ethnographic approaches and act, action research. So I went and I spent a number of weeks with, with four different communities across the world who've set up their own community-owned wind farms. Um, and really looking at how, what, when people are really involved in the decision-making and in the development process, and they're involved as the owners and the beneficiaries of these projects, how that can really, that, that deep level of participation can build a whole lot of very positive social outcomes around feelings of empowerment um, and, and social cohesion and really positive, strong associations with the technology. So I met a lot of people who see wind turbines and literally love them, feel them when they see the turbines, it fills them with hope, with joy, with pride. Um, and these are really positive associations and they're the type of associations we want people to have with with the renewable energy technology. Um, <clears throat> so post PhD, I've been doing more research with industry and with industry bodies like the Clean Energy Council and trying to understand how can we do our renewable energy development practice, whether it's community projects or, or large scale utility and corporate projects in a way that really helps communities to feel trusted, respected, involved. Um, so thinking about how do we do our community engagement practice through, through, through the process of planning our projects? How do we share the benefits of those projects with local communities? So they're the types of questions I've done a lot of thinking about. Um, and I'd just like to, I guess, to acknowledge that we've had renewable energy technology for a long time. It continues to improve, but basically we've had modern solar and wind technology for a long time. What's holding us back um, historically has been the politics um, and the social context. And um, now we've got state and federal governments, well, state governments and hopefully federal governments really getting behind renewables in a big way, which is excellent because we need a rapid transition. We need big projects to help get us there. But um, the opportunity that I really see for renewable energy is in doing development differently. Renewables is is scalable. That's one of the inherent attributes. It can be scaled to many different sizes. You know, you can have a couple of solar panels on your roof or you can have a solar farm. You can have a couple of small or medium scale turbines that could power a whole small town or you can have a utility scale project that um, produces hundreds of megawatts of energy. Um, so it's scalable and with that, um, you know, it's massively different from the energy systems of the past that have been very highly centralised. And so I see an opportunity there for communities, for households, for businesses, for farms to get involved in renewable energy and really directly participate and directly benefit. Um, and it's through that that I see us building a strong base of understanding and support in our community and in our society. And without that strong base of support, um, I think we're going to have real challenges for being able to deploy the large scale projects and the transmission projects that we need to meet our climate and renewable energy targets. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention a couple of the projects that we've done um, in the space. What we try to do is to innovate business models that help address some of the social inequalities that exist. Um, so, for example, at the moment, lots of households have solar on their roofs, which is great. We've got you know over two million 
um, solar rooftops in Australia. And um, but there's also 30 percent of people who can't put solar on their own roofs because they rent or because they live in an apartment. And so we have just um, just now released the share offer on a project called the Haystack Solar Garden. And this is a project that enables people to buy into a solar farm um, and own a plot in a similar way that you would own a plot in a community garden. So you own a plot in the solar garden um, and the electricity from that plot gets credited directly onto your bill. So you can be renting, you can move house, you can live in an apartment and you can still have your own solar panels. Um, so that's a, an exciting example of the work that we do to try to increase the accessibility of renewable energy and to really make sure that no one's no one's getting left behind in this transition and that we're giving we're giving communities um, and households the opportunity to really be engaged in it. Fantastic. Thanks, Jared. Such exciting work you're doing. Uh, so we've heard from Don around the asset scale work that he's doing. You've been um, focused on communities. I want to now stretch our minds up to the kind of whole industry level and government with Nick, uh, who's working in one of the main peak bodies, the main peak body um, on renewables in Australia. So over to you, Nick. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Lauren. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Abley. Uh, I'm the Clean Energy Council's Policy Director for Energy Generation and Storage. Uh, we have five different policy directors, which perhaps goes to the scale of the, the work that, that needs to be done in this space. Um, so I, I only deal with uh, large scale generation, similar to Don, it's mostly the utility scale projects uh, that, that I'm working on. More broadly, the role of the Clean Energy Council is as the peak representative body of the clean energy industry. We have uh, now up to over a thousand members uh, booming by the week um, and our, our membership ranges from uh, you know, companies that in small that install rooftop solar systems on on homes through to the biggest energy companies in the world uh, and it's it's a lot of the big renewable energy developers but also the the lawyers the engineers the the ecologists and others who provide services to those renewable energy developers uh, my, my background is, uh, my academic background has got nothing to do with this whatsoever. Uh, I've got a PhD, but it's completely useless. I have a PhD in organic chemistry uh, and spent 10 years in, in medical research trying to cure diseases until I realised that climate change was probably going to get rid of all of us and we should do something serious about that, uh, which sort of led me to a, a career shift 10, 10 or so years ago into sustainability and climate and energy. Uh, I've been at the CEC for coming up to a year now and before that I spent uh, almost a decade at Environment Victoria, which is uh, one of Australia's leading environmental not-for-profit uh, campaigning organisations. So I was a campaigns manager there for a long time uh, with, with a, the, the majority of that time spent on, on climate and energy campaigns to try to encourage uh, more, ambition, more ambition and greater pace in the energy transition. In terms of the the social issues that I encounter in my work, uh, I mean, as I said, my role is really around the the development and operation of large scale renewables and storage projects, so wind farms, solar farms, big batteries, pumped hydro, uh, and I think an important piece of context around this is, and and Don has already touched on uh, a, a bunch of the types of challenges that these projects face, and and Jara has talked about how they are situated with communities as well, and I agree with with you know pretty much everything that each of them has said so far, but uh, maybe to contextualise it a little bit, renewables are becoming the energy industry, uh, and this is a change that's happened very rapidly. So. You know, 10 years ago, renewable energy was this boutique little niche thing that was providing a fraction of our electricity. Uh, but through the calendar year of 2021, renewable energy in Australia provided almost a third of our electricity supply. Um, with the, the trajectory that we're currently on, we're heading towards something like 80 percent of renewable energy of electricity coming from renewables by 2030, if not more. Uh, and with that comes greater scrutiny, uh, with that comes higher expectations. And I, I think both of those things are, are good things, right? Like we need to be rolling out very large amounts of renewable energy very quickly in order to deal with the climate crisis that we're in. Uh, but we also need to be doing that well. We need to be doing that, that in a way that brings community along, uh, that minimizes the impacts of the industry. 
We've had for several years at the Clean Energy Council, uh, I think called the Best Practice Charter, uh, which we encourage all of our large scale project developing members to, to sign up to. And I think we have over 40 or so signatories, uh, which is really kind of, I, I see it as the, the, the 10 commandments of how to do renewable energy projects well. Uh, it, it outlines you know, 10, 10 principles for what it means to, to be a, a responsible project developer. So it's the types of things that Jared talked about in terms of community engagement, community benefit sharing, uh, but also you know, minimising uh, environmental impact, minimising use of agricultural land and those types of things. Uh, in terms of uncertainties and, and challenges and, and unknowns, I suppose, I mean, Don touched on this already, but the, the scale of change that is coming is enormous. Uh, we're currently at something around 20 or so gigawatts of, of renewable energy uh, in Australia heading, uh, you know, if, if, we, if we're successful, I suppose, uh, heading towards somewhere upwards of 150 gigawatts. So it's a, you know, it's a significant increase in terms of, you know, the, 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 the magnitude of, of projects that need to be built. And that's not to say anything of the 10,000 kilometres of transmission lines that we're going to need to connect all of these projects to, to the load centres in, in our cities. And with all of this, there are just still a lot of unanswered questions. Where are all these projects going to go? What impacts will they have on, on landscapes, on communities, on ecosystems? Do we have the workforce to do it? Do we have the materials to do it? It's really important to remember that we're not operating in a vacuum here. We are actually in a global race for skills and materials and investment. Uh, and if we if we take the foot off the accelerator or if we have it on the brake as we've had for much of the last decade at a federal level, we do start losing out in that race. Big investors will look at Australia and say, well, you know, we're better off trying to build our wind farms and solar farms in other countries. And, and we as a country lose out on that investment as a result. So I think the the shift in you know the state governments have obviously played a huge role in the last few years in in, in filling that gap. Uh, a thing that um, you know some of your some of the the people here might be aware of it, but a really great resource actually in terms of some of the the social challenges that we face is the re annual reporting from the Australian Energy Infrastructure Commissioner. Um, so if people aren't aware of it, I recommend having a look at that. One of the things that I found really interesting about their most recent report is that it, when there's a big element of um, uh, uh, fear might be too strong a word, but fear of change, I think, is a big part of this, because if you look at the, the complaints that come into the into the Australian, the Australian Energy Infrastructure Commissioner's office, and that's what they're there for, they're a complaints handling uh, body set up by the federal government. The vast majority of, com of complaints come in for proposed projects, but once projects are established, everyone's kind of like, oh yeah, this is fine, and, and they move along. That's not to say necessarily that's the case for every single project, but what it shows is that when something comes along that is going to lead to some kind of land use change, there is anxiety for, for completely understandable reasons. Uh, but often once the project is there, then everyone's like, oh, no big deal, it's, and, and things move on. Uh, so, like, I'm really interested in how uh, you know, how we how we get ahead of that, how we manage that, um, and, and deal with some of these social dynamics. Uh, I'll leave it there, and um, looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks, Nick. So many interesting insights there. Um, and now to talk to an organisation or institution that's busy doing its own. Our work towards being part of the renewable energy transition. I'd like to invite Michael Anderson to tell us what he and his colleagues are doing at RMIT Uni. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for having me along, uh, Lauren. Um, yeah, as mentioned earlier, um, so I'm the manager of carbon and sustainability for RMIT. So I sit on the operations side of the organisation, uh, primarily responsible for the university's energy profile, uh, energy contracting, greenhouse gas emissions profile and all associated reporting. Um, a little bit of a background to me, you probably already tell from the accent, I'm, I'm a Kiwi. Uh, I studied energy management out of Otago University in New Zealand. Um, so I'm one of those um, rare people that is working in the area that they studied at university. Um, 
So in this space, um, the work we're doing here at RMIT, um, we our big goal is that we aim to be a carbon certified carbon neutral organization by 2025. Um, how are we going to get there? Um, we have publicly released our carbon management plan uh, that has been developed with the assistance of Lauren and, and others within RMIT, um, drawing on that academic expertise as well as the uh, operations uh, input as well. Um, this plan really guides us um, towards that carbon neutral goal, um, but has a strong encouragement um, for the expansion of renewable energy, uh, specifically both on-site and off-site renewables. Um, this is activities such as our solar PV rollouts, large scale renewable contracting, um, which I probably actually just want to briefly touch on from a consumer point of view. Um, so RMIT is actually party to two large corporate power purchase agreements. Um, we were a key partner in the world first group purchase of renewable energy uh, through the Melbourne Renewable Energy Project with our um, fantastic partners, the city of Melbourne, uh, just down the road from us um, on our city campus here. Um, and subsequent, oh, that, that contract actually ended up contracting with the Crowlands Wind Farm uh, in northwestern Victoria. Uh, and touching on some of those earlier points that have been mentioned, um, the specific contractual mechanisms and the tenders we took to market were, were specifically about driving local investment in Victoria, uh, sharing the benefits of that wind farm, uh, and includes things like uh, social funds uh, for the local communities uh, where that operates, so the Crowlands region uh, there. Um, subsequent to that, um, RMIT took the bold step to lead a second renewable energy purchasing group uh, with a number of corporate partners. Uh, we weren't really creative with the title, we called it the Melbourne Renewable Energy Project Number Two, uh, and that ultimately ended up contracting with the Yellow Oak South Wind Farm uh, in um, Western Victoria. Um, so additional to that, with the current uh, uncertainty in global energy markets. I mean, you really can't miss it if you're turning the uh, seven o'clock news on these days. Um, there, there's a lot of uncertainty there on where electricity prices are going, where gas prices are going. And when I say uncertainty, let's be honest, it's in an upward direction. Um, subsequent to, to all of this, we've been navigating our way through, um, through how we're going to approach our energy uh, contracts going forward. And I'm actually really proud to announce that we've actually increased our commitment to renewable energy, uh, expanding the volumes that we're going to be purchasing under our existing arrangements. And from the 1st of January next year, we will actually be supplied 100% uh, of our uh, campus operations here in Australia uh, will be supplied by renewable energy, um, which is a fantastic sort of new step for us and obviously makes a huge step change in our emissions uh, as an organisation. Touching on um, some of these social aspects that um, have really sort of come up in this journey that we have, have moved through. And I'm taking it from sort of a, a consumer point of view, so a, a large buyer. Um, there is inherent complexity in uh, the contractual mechanisms that are in place for uh, large consumers to be um, purchasing renewable energy. This is complexity around uh, electricity certificate markets, LGCs or STCs in um, the smaller scale markets for those of you who are aware of them. I often get asked with what are we actually purchasing here and having to really explain from first principles what certificate markets are, uh, how these certificates are traded and what they actually represent. Um, so it, it's something that I think we, we need to do better as, as experts here in this um, renewable uh, renewable energy field to really explaining the fundamentals when we are talking about about um, renewable energy. Um, I think some of this has really probably presented itself as a bit of a healthy scepticism around carbon offsets and renewable energy certificates. Um, I think maybe for some the pendulum might have swung a little bit too far and there's a reluctance to purchase these because of the uncertainty around that integrity. I think we really need to encourage appropriate sort of due diligence around authenticity, additionality, uh, documentation and integrity of projects um, so that we're appropriately evaluating these before we uh, jump into large purchasing decisions. And I really contrast this kind of um, uh, these decisions with the complexity of uh, on-site solar PV. You know, everybody really understands that. Um, 
you know, in my experience locally at RMIT, the business cases for solar PV on our sites have essentially ridden themselves. You know, it's it's an easy case to sell. Um, people really understand it because you've had interactions with it, or you might have a family member or a friend uh, that has put rooftop PV on. Um, so inherently, you know, there's not a lot of expect, uh, explanation that is really required to understand that. Um, and then finally, just really want to touch on some of the big unknowns for us are uh, really on how are we going to reach that carbon neutral goal? Um, sort of as a consumer, we know we've got these contractual mechanisms in place, which I've just talked about, that address our electricity profile. Um, but subsequently, we still have a residual natural gas profile that we, we do need to address that contribute to our scope one emissions. We know there are a range of electricity based solutions um, that are um, provided. But the size and scale of them uh, is not quite there for when we when we talk at large precincts uh, levels. Um, additional to this is our supply chain. Uh, we're a large consumer of broad goods and services as an organisation, like any large organisation is. Um, but how do we start to influence our supply chain to reduce emissions? We know we're not really going to be in a position going forward realistically at this stage to be appointing only carbon neutral suppliers across all provision of goods and services. In some cases, they don't exist. And in some cases, you might be um, contrasting that with appropriate business decisions. I think of things like, you know, are we going to only appoint carbon neutral law firms to assist us with any legal work the organization does? Are we only going to appoint carbon neutral maintenance providers? Are we only going to look to appoint carbon neutral caterers? And are we sure we're going to be able to actually find a healthy market of competition um, for suppliers in this space? Uh, in my experience in most recent years, I don't think we've matured enough here yet. We're continuing to ask this question in some of our large scale tenderers and our procurement processes. Um, but I, I would say I have been underwhelmed by the responses from the market at this stage. Uh, so I think we really need to look at where these next next steps are coming from. And um, hopefully, you know, renewable energy is an extremely important um, part that plays a role in everybody's supply chain. And we're, we're seeing that, um, I guess, through things like the impacts of inflation. I know I'm touching a lot of issues here, but you know, as we see energy um, rise in cost, we see goods and services rise in cost as well. So it's a hugely complex space, but uh, a lot of different thoughts there. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. I'm glad you picked up the need for carbon neutral lawyers. Um, I keep waiting for the day when um, people are going to request carbon neutral degrees, carbon neutral research and put some pressure on us universities. But uh, speaking of universities, um, we're going to now hear from Nicola Wyland, who uh, has done a range of work in the energy space, but including bringing us down to the household scale. Uh, so over to you, Nikki. Thank you, Lauren. And I will just share my screen. I brought along a few slides. Um, so I am an architect by background and I'm German. But I did my PhD in residential energy efficiency and health at RMIT and equity emerged as an important theme. And much of my work is now centered on fairness in the low carbon housing transition. So one in five Australians are experiencing bill payment difficulties. They're rationing their energy use with detrimental effects on health and social functioning or reducing spending on non-energy foods like um, needs like medication or food. So as we are working towards affordable, reliable, sustainable, renewable, modern energy for all, the energy justice framework calls for a critical examination of who benefits and who is missing out, whose values and circumstances are recognized and who's actually participating in the decision making. Energy vulnerability happens at that intersection of risk to harm sensitivity and adaptive capacity. Housing quality is a key determinant, as is the ability to retrofit one's home. So groups that are likely to be in energy vulnerability in Australia are older people, those with chronic physiological and mental illnesses, tenants and apartment dwellers, because they lack agency, choice, control, access to information and technology, and structural factors like um, dwelling characteristics and tenancy consumer laws contribute to this problem as well. So 
So for example, we did an evaluation of the Victorian Energy Upgrade Program. This offers subsidies for retrofits and upgrades of homes. It's not means tested so everyone can get it. Activities are likely to reduce one's energy costs. And we found that renters in metropolitan Melbourne may have been at a particular risk of missing out on these retrofit subsidies. And that is concerning as it meant that renters have a, are at a triple disadvantage. They tend to be on a low income and live in poorer quality housing. They've got limited access to retrofit subsidies and they carry the burden of the cross subsidization because the costs of these subsidies are just spread across all energy consumers. So this utilitarian approach to giving away subsidies that everyone can participate uh, may actually be regressive, although it may maximize CO2 emission reductions. With regards to recognition, well, energy vulnerability is largely hidden in Australia. It's not recognized institutionally. We are not measuring it. There are no educators and we're not monitoring progress. Um, we've got few conventional indicators like disconnection uh, or not being able to heat the home, but not being able to cool the home is hardly ever measured in surveys. And many householders will always pay their bills. Uh, or not ask for energy assistance. Also, there is a neglect of residential energy efficiency in policies and programs, and I get it. So it's much easier to put solar PV on roofs. But before we provide renewable energy supply, we need to reduce the energy demand of existing homes, because even renewable energies, they need resources and they need land as well. So technologically, Retrofits are possible and easy. They're mostly voluntary in Australia, but worldwide the uptake lags behind expectations. So, and that's really because very often they're approached as a technological or econometric solution and um, really neglect the emotions, the memories and trust of information and installer that really govern these decisions by householders. And with respect to procedural justice, well, we found power imbalances within homes. There's a ranking on who decides on, you know, is the heating on or the cooling off. Uh, we talked about renters lacking agency, but also householders often feel powerless in communication with the energy retailers, just around choosing contracts, changing contracts or bill disputes. Um, community solar power promises to be a tool of empowerment. Um, international research shows that participation may not be very inclusive, so that white family on the federal graph is intentional, and the distribution of benefits may not be progressive. And we've heard that the low carbon solar transition is well on its way. So last year we investigated how future low carbon gases may affect energy vulnerability very little research, so we had to ask stakeholders too. And we found that there is a risk of distributional injustices because the burden of infrastructure and new appliances cost is probably going to be um, distributed unevenly if we're not careful. Um, physical access to hydrogen, for example, may be limited due to location of the dwelling or the housing type. And there's very little understanding of householder gas practices and how they balance electricity and gas. So ways forward really is to consider capabilities because energy vulnerability is not a purely economic problem. And also there's the need to acknowledge the social benefits like health and social functioning in this transition. We need progressive policies that aim for equal outcomes rather than equal distribution of money and better protection of vulnerable householders who lack agency and control. Also, when it comes to the implementation, collaborations are really important. We need to go away from this very siloed approach of social services and health and energy and housing and engage port different portfolios and disciplines in addressing these uh, inequities. And we have to work towards a social contract. So there are so many uh, mom and dad Landlords, for example, so if they would ensure good energy efficiency in their own rental properties before it even becomes mandatory, that would be a big step forward. 
and just looking out for people who may be hiding their difficulties because of pride and helping them negotiate new contracts. Um, so I can stop sharing. No, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. Yeah, it's a very important reminder about what this looks like from the perspectives of um, diverse households, um, including those for whom other energy questions perhaps are front of mind uh, rather than necessarily the source. So look, there's a range of uh, social complexities here. We've touched on all sorts of scales of the renewable energy question. Uh, but to kick us off, we've actually got a um, very thoughtful comment here in the, the um, Q&A from Luke Wilkinson. So thank you, Luke, and please anyone else do jump in and um, put your questions and also replies and comments in there. Uh, and so this is, I guess, about one of the, the tensions that I think came through the presentations as we heard, which is on the one hand, you know, we've got this accelerating, um, expanding, much needed transition to renewable energy. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, as Nick touched on, you know, that the spaces and places involved in that and therefore the communities involved in that, uh, as well as the question of the end users, uh, shifts as well. And so this kind of need for those social dimensions to be considered. So the question here is, is there a, a, a tension between taking things uh, perhaps in a, in a slightly slower way to really work through those social questions and, and to engage with community and end users at the same time as getting those, uh, the scale of change we need and the pace of change we need. It's not an easy question, um, but it's one that obviously we do need to address. Uh, so Jarrah, I might throw to you first because that example that you mentioned just at the end there seems to me a sort of innovative approach to trying to combine the scale and pace of change, but also one that engages people who are involved. Yeah, thanks. I think it's a really it's a really important question, and what we see, what we are seeing emerging, is instances where projects um, were maybe trying to pursue them too quickly. Um, you know, and the rollout of the renewable energy zones might be an example. So state based policies wanting to establish renewable energy zones that are really about encouraging um, consolidating new large scale renewable energy projects um, and transmission lines in areas with strong renewable energy resources. But if we pursue that process too quickly without bringing the community along and without providing clear pathways for people to be engaged, you know, to get the skills and training needed to be able to be employed in that industry without preparing local businesses to be able to participate in tenders for products and services, without enabling the communities that we're asking to host these big projects, without enabling them to also be to have renewables in their own homes and their own businesses and their own farms, then I think we're going to come across um, a lot of social barriers to that change progressing. And I think the solution is to um, to provide avenues to support households to do things like energy efficiency and renewables, um, to support community energy projects. These projects that bring renewable energy alive in the hearts and minds of everyday people so that they then have a platform of understanding um, and to be able to engage and think about the broader energy transition. Um, and the program in Victoria that I know Luke, Luke has been working on, the Community Power Hubs program, has been a really great example. So there's been um, six community power hubs set up in different parts of Victoria and they're supporting local energy ambition, local energy projects of all different kinds. Um, and that's enabling things like small businesses to do renewables, supporting the hospital to decrease its energy costs, supporting community energy projects, bulk buy programs of solar panels so that you, you're reducing the barriers um, for households to be able to put solar on their roofs. And I think these community power hubs is a really great way um, of supporting, making it accessible for communities, breaking down some of those barriers. Um, and I will just finish by saying I think there's there's a lot of value. Um, I, I draw a lot on feminist research in my work um, and one of the the great learnings that we've we've learnt from 
the feminist movement and from feminist research is the value of small individual actions in our everyday lives and how that can add up to really broad scale changes. So changes in our, at our own kitchen table, changes on our own roofs, in our own practice, in our own homes, that cumulatively together, that adds up to really big change. Um, and so, you know, we already have 13 gigawatts, I believe it is nationally, of small and medium scale renewable energy, which is huge. So let's not discount the power of, um, of building renewable energy at that scale at the same time as pursuing large scale corporate and commercial projects. Mm, well put, thank you. And I mean, arguably the slowest way to do it is um, a series of false starts, including, you know, trying to roll out mega projects that then hit some kind of, you know, quagmire of legal and media um, problems, etc. And so, you know, one of the fastest and most efficient ways to do it is to tackle this community engagement question at the front end. Don, have you had experience in um, well, how have you gone maybe convincing, I don't know, some of your colleagues or clients, those you work with, to really take that community engagement question seriously from the outset, uh, rather than a kind of um, subsequent thing that has to be addressed? You mentioned you had been involved in a project that perhaps learnt that the hard way. Yeah, good question. I think in terms of obviously my, my space towards the latter phase of development construction, um, I don't normally have the role of convincing that, but certainly the last, I mean, the, the idea of having a social license very, very early in the project is, and, and, and the value of that, I think, especially recently, is not lost at all on some of the, you know, more well-known developers in, in, in the market. Um, and there's certainly a, I guess, disparity between those developers and, and others who, who don't understand the, essentially the economic value of that, of getting that right from the outset. I've certainly been in projects where um, you know, right through construction and actually beyond that, that lack of true social licenses has caused serious economic pain through, through the projects. And so I think, I guess, examples like that um, tell the story fairly clearly um, that it's required. I wasn't a public point in there, I suppose. The other end of the scale as to what Jarrah is referring to, there's an interesting, almost a new technology all into itself, which um, in terms of social license and, and the ghost load we're talking about in the, in the question, of, so, but, but taking our time um, to get that right is, is offshore wind, um, where you've got a huge number of, I mean, I, I expect Nick has a number, but I, I, I expect that the figure we're talking about in terms of hundreds of gigawatts might even already be there and developments vying for a, a feasibility license already offshore now. And so I guess from a community impact standpoint, it might raise an interesting question politically um, that currently the value of energy from offshore wind is around about double the value of the cost of energy from onshore wind. There's expectations that the gap will be closed pretty quick. But and I think the current projects or likely projects are a result of sponsorship from the Victorian government and so far as looking at a similar thing. So there's potentially a, a lever that can be pulled there politically to move quite a large chunk of renewable wind generation Offshore, I'm not saying that social issues don't exist. You, you can still see them and you've got to talk to the mammals out there as well. Um, mm. But it is an interesting, an interesting side story, I suppose, to where we can really still roll out renewables at a very, very large scale and potentially sidestep a lot of the social issues that we have on shore. Mm. It's very interesting. I mean, there is that just that question of proximity to settlement uh, in general with renewable energy and the, the pros and cons of having it there uh, in the midst of a local community, perhaps adding a whole lot of benefits over and above energy and or having these large um, projects that we know are going in what is uh, often uh, misconceived as <laughs> terra nullius or aqua nullius, we might say. Um, yeah, so, but very interesting um, comparison. Nick, you see this and I guess, you know, because you're working at that sort of industry level, it might not be the sort of local communities side of things that you see as much as broader public social license if you like is do you see a lot of advantage in building up a, a general enthusiasm for renewable energy uh, to kind of act almost as an enabler of site specific projects yeah i think that's exactly right um uh, so many things to say about all of this um 
I mean, it, just quickly on the on the offshore wind point. I mean, yes, I I completely agree. There's enormous potential for offshore wind. Uh, just you know, geographically, there's enormous potential. I'm really wary at the idea that, uh, that that we start adopting a mindset that it's getting difficult to build renewables on land, and so we should just build them in the water. Um, I mean, Don's already touched on the point that it, it's significantly more expensive right now to build offshore wind, and and will remain so for some time. So the the trade off that that we're kind of grappling with there is if we if we don't want to deal with uh, figuring out how to get renewables done well on land, we are actually making the energy transition more expensive, right? Like if we if we stop doing on land renewables to do more offshore renewables, it becomes more expensive. Which is not to say we don't need offshore wind. I'm a big fan of it, uh, and and we we definitely need it. Um, but it's it's not. Uh, I don't think we should view it as the the solution to onshore uh, social problems uh, because that has other consequences, right? Like it, it, it will just increase cost of electricity more than, than onshore would. Uh, in terms of managing some of the social license issues with, with onshore, um, you know, Jared, touch, Jared touched on, on the renewable energy zones that we're seeing state governments establish. And one of the challenges that, that we have there is that uh, like the whole point of renewable energy zones is to create economic efficiency by aligning investment in grid augmentation with investment in generation and storage projects, right? Like that's the whole point of it. Um, and that economic efficiency is something that we, we should be striving to pursue, but governments need to be involved in this, right? Governments can't just draw a line on a map and say, here be a renewable energy zone, and then just say to project developers, Go go do what you like in terms of uh, finding sites for your projects. I mean, obviously there are there are very extensive planning requirements and and assessment processes, uh, but you know our view is very much that there's a there's a role for state governments to to preemptively work with communities in those renewable energy zones to talk about the fact that this decision by governments to establish renewable energy zones to get that economic efficiency of grid augmentation is going to lead to an increase in concentration of projects in those areas. And rather than, you know, and not, not to say that, that state governments are doing this, but rather than stepping back and saying, OK, well, we've created the renewable energy zone and now it's up to project developers to, to go and do their community engagement, we definitely see a significant role for state governments here in, 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 in driving that community engagement. And part of, the, I mean, one of the things we see is, is, uh, is consultation fatigue, right? So. You know, if you're in a particularly sunny or windy area of, say, you know, central West Orana, where, uh, which is the first renewable energy zone to get off the ground, you're potentially being approached by half a dozen different renewable energy companies who are trying to build wind or solar farms in that area. And, you know, as a landholder, I can only imagine that that's completely doing your head in when you're just trying to go about your life. Um, but if it was a bit more centralised, a bit more coordinated, uh, then I think we would see a lot less uh, confusion, a lot less anxiety from communities, uh, and I think it would lead to that uh, greater understanding at the at the I guess at the broader scale of the benefits that that, that renewables can provide across regional Australia. Mm -hmm. Lauren, can I just jump in very quickly? I just want to remind people of the fantastic example in Victoria of Hepburn Wind. It's a community owned wind farm. It's two turbines. They are two megawatt turbines. They are big. They have 60 neighbours within two kilometres. And you can see them from the main street of Dalesford. And it's been really, it's it's had such a positive impact in the community. Yes, they've had to work through issues, but it is it is such a well-loved project. Um, and I've seen commercial projects as well be be really well received and well loved. So this is about doing our practice well and understanding what contributes to to projects being well received, rather than saying let's get them out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, know and love that project myself. Um, I just wanted to finish up. I want to turn to this question of consumers and what this looks like from consumers, whether they're big industrial consumers, whether they're universities, uh, whether they're households and, and individuals. It feels like um, you know, there's a whole host of issues that we have barely touched on today um, for consumers around all of this. 
If you were to see, you know, one um, one positive change to make renewable energy use a little bit easier, Michael, <laughs> um, and you too, Nikki, um, what would you like to see just briefly? What what sort of change, what social complexity, if you like, we're using that language today, would you like to see cleared away uh, to make it easier to become part of the renewable energy market as a consumer? Um, probably jump in there and say, bringing back some of the strength that we originally saw with um, with options like green power. Um, it's I, I feel as if those kind of um, products that have been sort of led by governments to to really drive and make it easy for people to opt in um, have sort of fallen a little bit out of favour in more recent time. Um, so I would love to see some integrity come back to some of those markets. Uh, I would also like probably to see it more more broadly, arguably less of, less of an opt-in. I know we currently have things like the renewable energy target that force all of us as, as residential and also as corporates to, to essentially be inadvertently purchasing uh, volumes of LGCs in your um, in your energy bills already, but I, I would love to see that strengthened so it becomes part and parcel of not a, hey, could you opt into this? Do you know, are you a good corporate citizen to, to be a part of this journey? But hey, this should be part of the entire community's journey. Uh, so I'd love to see th those targets strengthened and it sort of sort of almost happen a little bit behind the scenes. <laughs> Great answer. Thanks, Michael. Nikki, what one change would you like to see to make this easier for consumers? I think what is really needed and it's coming out of everyone's responses is respect for consumers. Um, so the kind of information that is being transmitted, who, who transmits it, uh, there are big questions around trust and householders have been burned and they've seen things that are not working, especially if it is around the home uh, with tradies coming in and not cleaning up. Um, there are things around gender as well. So especially women are not keen to listen to, you know, someone who, who knocks on the door, for example. So to build that community trust and also perhaps look beyond the, the entity of the house to community energy so that uh, solar garden project, for example, is already attaching this. So, um, you know, there are examples where there is a precinct renewable electricity or precinct heating rather than individualized systems. And I think that would also help. Mm, excellent. Well, I think, I mean, one of the things that renewable energy and the whole sort of question of the shift really um, requires in my mind is kind of moving across some of these conventional boundaries. So the production consumption one is a, is a clear one that renewable energy messes with in a way that has never really been you know, possible with centralised fossil fuels. Um, but at the same time, I'd like to <laughs> emphasise the boundaries we're crossing in this session here. You know, we've got um, private sector, um, NGO sector, university sector, we've got a range of um, different scales, range of different expertise. And I think it's by having these conversations across these conventional silos uh, that we will be able to work out the complex, but in the end, very positive uh, approaches that are possible. So with that, um, I will draw this to a close by thanking um, our panelists very much for giving up their time and energy, devoting their um, minds to a question which is possibly a bit obtuse, <laughs> but um, has, I think, surfaced to some very tangible and very real and important issues. So thank you very much. And um, we'll say goodbye and thank you to the audience as well. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.